I'm your host, Riem Zin Labidin, and you are listening to Tech Tag Podcast. Today, our guest is Fabian Brown. He's a chapter lead and a software developer at Moya. I'm very excited to talk to him. So let's meet with him and learn more about his inspiring journey. Hello, Fabian. Welcome to Tech Tech. I'm happy to have you today. Yeah, I'm also very happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks for accepting the invitation. And could you introduce yourself for the audience to know you better and also tell us some fun facts about yourself? With pleasure. My name is Fabian Braun, and I currently work at a German mobility uh, company called Moya. And I am working as a software engineer for 12 years now, I think, should be something like or 13 years. What I do besides programming is that I uh, like dancing. So I uh, dance Lindy Hop, which is a dance originating from the 20s on uh, Charleston music, swing music. Yeah, but I think there are quite some programmers in, in, the, in this dance community. I think uh, I'm interested to know more about it. I will ask you about it later. Yes. There are lots of uh, very funny YouTube videos uh, that you could watch. <laughs> cool. Yeah, maybe a bit more information. So I was uh, raised in Aachen in Germany, and uh, I also started my uh, studies there in computer science, essentially. And then I lived um, in a couple of European countries during my studies. So in Belgium and Luxembourg, uh, also the Netherlands. And uh, at some point I moved to Hamburg and that's where I live today. Yeah, and I really like the city. Very happy to live in, in Hamburg. Oh. Yeah, it's a beautiful city. <laughs> and uh, from my understanding, you said it's computer science or something like that, right? Yes, exactly. So I did something, it's like a dual studying, um, a German uh, special thing where you uh, study and work at the same time. So otherwise I wouldn't have these years of work experience also. So I basically right after graduating from college, I started working and studying at a university of applied sciences. And I did like, um, yeah, 50% each. So 50% of, of the time I was visiting lectures in the university and 50% of the time I was working as a programmer in, um, a large French enterprise, which had one office in, in Aachen, where I was at that time. It was uh, quite packed. So usually I had lectures for the full day from eight to six uh, during the days where I had lectures. And then on the other days, I, I just had regular working days. And in the first year on the job, I was basically just learning the basics of programming with my colleagues there. So I guess I annoyed them with beginner's questions quite a lot uh, in the in the beginning yeah it's nice to have people around you who can guide you yes i was very lucky uh d did you have to learn french during that time no uh <laughs> it was uh, it was a french enterprise but the office was completely german it was actually Uh, it used to be an independent company, and at some point it was bought by this uh, enterprise. The people there, they were still speaking German natively, mostly. Um, I even had to write source code in German, which, which now <laughs> seems quite... Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I haven't encountered that anymore since back then. Um, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> And uh, do you remember, like, what inspired you to choose this path? It, was it like straightforward directly? You got this choice? So but to be honest, I never took a lot of care to take these decisions uh, in my life, I would say. So I was in school and there was a time where I was even like very bad at math. So one of my teachers, uh, she was saying, oh, you're the only one where I'm really concerned uh, in the entire course, whether you can keep up. Uh, and that was in math, which is, of course, quite important um, to study computer science. But then luckily I had a teacher change and suddenly I was good at math. So I would say if you think that you are not good at math, maybe it's just your teacher. Yeah. Um, don't 
trust too much uh, your own feeling about that. And um, yeah, and then, well, then I had this very good teacher and I um, started really loving uh, math. And also I had like some computer science uh, courses in school, which uh, were very basic, but I also enjoyed it. And um, so uh, at some point in school, we had like a career, career advice session with an external coach. Mm -hmm. And she asked me, yeah, what do you like? And I said, yeah, well, I like math and computer science. And, and then she pulled out like uh, this uh, dual study out of her um, bag and said, look at these documents here. I have, I have this ad for pursuing this path. And I was like, yeah, okay, sounds good. Yeah, okay, I will do it. Um, so that was basically it. I didn't really... Yeah, I didn't really look left and right. I didn't pick the university very carefully or anything. Uh, I just kind of wait, went the e easy path. Yeah, and in the end, it turned out really well. And yeah, later on, I sometimes had a bit uh, to adapt uh, to, to the situation, but I, don't, I didn't really struggle to, to I, I didn't think a lot about it. So it was easy for me because of that, that I just picked uh, this, this path. And I was not aware of the, the, the choice that I was making to a full extent, but uh, in back perspective, I'm very, very happy about it. Uh, many people would be interested to know why would programming be a, a good career path to follow? Yes. Yeah. So what I really like about it, that it's like a handcraft. So you basically, you create something uh, that wasn't there before. Yeah. Just like art kind of, you, you, you make something that isn't there before and you can decide whether you just want to make something functional or practical or you can also make it extremely sophisticated and um, and like a real piece of art and uh, uh, learn everything about it. And and at the end, you you really have this thing that you feel that you can almost touch. And um, in the best case, you haven't created it on your own, but in a team. And this is really rewarding. And I think that's actually rare in in uh, jobs nowadays. So. In a lot of jobs, you you have to manage things. You have to, yeah, you have to connect people. You and look after people and uh, steer processes and things like that, which can also be uh, very nice. But for me, um, yeah, I I really like programming because then at the end I have something that I can kind of show and say, look, this is what I made, and it can do this yeah. and it can do that. It's amazing. It's yeah. It's like a rewarding feeling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's what I really like uh, still until today about uh, programming. It's a good uh, way to put it into words. Yes. Yeah. And the way how you found guidance, it, this will save more time uh, for you. And I like the how uh, in your school they have someone who asks people what they think they like and they don't, so they can help them with their knowledge and their guidance to go there. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. That was really great in that case. Cool. And uh, do you remember like your first experience and how challenging it was? Yeah. So I remember that in the beginning, I was basically um, in a team which was developing an internal testing tool. And so we were building a, a software that was used also in the same company. And uh, the, the people who were using the software, they were sitting like one flow below us. And I remember that like at some point I got like my first feature request that I should implement. And I was really excited because then I was writing emails with the, with the users of the tool. And um, I think I was very shy and um, very respectful and writing very lengthy emails <laughs> <laughs> to cover every detail. And, um, and they, were, they were very nice. They knew that I was a, a new person. Yeah, and then I actually, I, I remember that at some point I had the feature implemented and I was showing it to them and they were testing it out and saying, yeah, this needs still to change. And 
this is already good and, and et cetera. And that was very cool. And I think it's also, um, so I was lucky because they were very nice and supportive. And at the same time, that was always the, the, the projects that I liked most where I had direct feedback from the users of what I was building. And it's always like, you're really getting out of your comfort zone, talking to the people who actually use your software. And sometimes <laughs> you feel like, oh, I'm so ashamed now that this doesn't work. And I'm, I'm so sorry because it creates so much trouble for you. <laughs> um, but that's the, just, um, yeah, when they like it, then it's also extremely rewarding. Yeah. And, um, you're, you're, you're very happy uh, about what you did and it's very motivating. Do they have understanding uh, about programming, etc.? Like, or uh, do you have to find your way to explain it outside of technical perspective? So back then, they were also programmers. So for me, it, it was even a bit daunting because they knew everything better than, than I when, when I implemented this. They knew better what they needed uh, and they knew better also probably how to program it even if they were writing different software. Yeah, but um, that's of course not the case usually. Or, well, I, I guess for you, it's maybe also the case when you work on, on a framework for programmers, then they also know a lot. But for example, I nowadays, I, I work for a mobility company. So the end users are people uh, taking the, uh, the ride on the street. And, um, and of course they don't know how it's, how it's programmed. So then you need to be careful to think about their problems and not your problems when you, yeah. when you are programming. Yeah. And to understand uh, their perspective because it's totally different. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, after that, how did you progress into your career? Like when you change it between jobs what was your focus in which area like was your focus while you yes. were looking for a job the critics not critics no yeah characteristic <laughs> yeah characteristics yes <laughs> so basically i was in this large french enterprise um and i had a very nice boss who kind of helped me a lot and said when i wanted to do something just said yeah fabian it's a great idea uh here i will help you with it and so I, I had an opportunity to go to France for several trips to work with colleagues there. And after I finished my bachelor's, I still continued working there um, while doing my master's degree. Yeah. And um, during that time, I, I kind of switched my focus to machine learning. So I studied artificial intelligence in my master's because it was a hype and I jumped on the hype train. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then uh, I, I still continued to work, but I needed a project to apply my machine learning knowledge at work. And uh, in Brussels, there was actually a department doing fraud detection with machine learning. So I had the opportunity to, to stay at my employer, uh, but go to Brussels and work there uh, part-time um, on this machine learning project in fraud detection mm -hmm. and yeah and that was very very nice so I basically followed my my interest and I also followed the the hype train of uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence and uh, to be honest I at some point I realized that uh, I should have studied operations research instead of machine learning which is nice because now <laughs> Now I actually work in, in operations research uh, and mm -hmm. I uh, don't do machine learning anymore because it was even more fascinating for me. Yeah, so I, I would say you can jump on the hype train. It's fine. Try it. But then also once you have kind of discovered it, you can also move on or decide that it's not the right path or something like this. Yeah, yeah this is true, especially with tech always there is like something new going on. And uh, if you have the flexibility to um, learn and if you want to focus 100% on it so you can be more expert on it, it's okay to change. And this is a di difficult. It's part of the challenge in the journey. Yeah, absolutely. And um, sometimes you only realize it afterwards. 
so you 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 change because something in your environment changes for me it was a job change that meant that i would switch from machine learning to operations research and then you realize oh i actually like this more than what i was doing previously so yeah you don't always know in advance and sometimes it's also good just to change to see um how you might like something else but i don't want to advertise for frequent job changing <laughs> here yeah i i think it's also really good to to make the best out of what you have at the place where you are yeah and uh go ahead yeah uh sorry <laughs> uh i mean like based on what you are experiencing if you think that there is everything is fine with the team with the job with the business you are enjoying what you are doing keep doing it and if you think there is something is off uh, that stops you from learning or from enjoying maybe you can have a look for the what is out there maybe this it's not an easy decision but uh, yeah <laughs> yeah I agree. And if I wouldn't have had this boss who was giving me all of these uh, opportunities, uh, then I would have probably not stayed that long at my first employer. I stayed seven years, which is quite wow. a huge time. But okay, you have to count that I, the first three years, I was really a very junior programmer, just still being in university. So I probably it doesn't really count. <laughs> yeah. uh, it does count, I think, because this is like, because you cannot jump into, like it, it is your first steps that led you to where you were after these years. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Yeah. You mentioned about, uh, you changed it to the operation research and uh, like, how was this? Was it right after this experience or can you tell us about uh, how was the journey? Yes, so um, I then finished my master's degree in artificial intelligence. And there were actually two, two programs at this university, uh, which was, by the way, the University of Maastricht in the Netherlands. Um, they had a track for artificial intelligence and a track for operations research. And yeah, I really picked artificial intelligence I already explained it, right? So I, I picked it because I thought, yeah, it's probably more cool than than operations research. Yeah. And um, but I was aware of operations research. There were also like courses that you could do from the other track, and I already also had a, a track um, uh, of operations research in my bachelor, so I knew a bit already. And then after finishing my master's, I I still. Uh, work continued working for the, the company and continued working in fraud detection and doing machine learning. I actually also published uh, two papers um, coming out of my master and that took like a long time after what my master's was already finished to get a paper published. It was mm -hmm. like uh, a long time and I also considered back then at that time to do a PhD in computer science and at the end when I realized how how long it takes to publish a paper and yeah and how the entire scientific world works I was kind of no I I don't think it, I want to invest now another five to seven years uh, to get a PhD and then I I kept looking um, then for for private reasons uh, I actually moved to Luxembourg and at that moment I also thought okay now it's it's time to change the employer. <laughs> um, I had paid back. Um, so my employer paid my, my studies also, my master studies, which uh, were not for free in the Netherlands. And um, I had paid back this, this money at that time. Uh, and then I, I was kind of free to try out something completely new. So I went to Luxembourg and I became um, mm -hmm. uh, a, a freelancer. So I was part of a, a software consultancy firm who was uh, then having clients. Yeah, I was basically um, a consultant to them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there I worked in the, in the cloud native area, but it was only a short period of time. It was just half a year. Um, and I did a lot of things with running software in the cloud uh, to say it mm -hmm. uh, like this. 
and then again for private reasons i didn't want to stay in luxembourg mm -hmm. so um, i i had to look out for something new and uh, and that was then moya so the, the, the company where i'm still employed today in hamburg and basically to land the job at moya uh, my my little experience in operations research was quite helpful yeah there uh, there was a position for developing algorithms mm -hmm. for um, an operations research optimization problem yeah and they accepted me for for that position and uh, since then i have really gotten into uh, operations research again and dealing with a different kind of algorithms um yeah so i'm interested to know more about operations research okay yeah so i will talk about it with a lot of pleasure <laughs> <laughs> yeah let's take for example the moya operations research problem so when you want to build like a taxi service but you don't just transport one passenger at a time, but you combine multiple passengers together that are maybe going in the same direction or something like this. That's basically an operations research problem mm -hmm. um, because you need to decide, let's say you have a hundred taxis in your fleet and you, you need to decide which taxi is going to pick up which passenger and in which order. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of possibilities how to um, schedule all your taxis, right? You can yeah. you can say, okay, take the I take the first taxi and I take the first passenger uh, or the closest passenger, and I say that this taxi is going to pick up this closest passenger, and then you can proceed probably for a while doing it with this strategy. But at some point, you realize that the the plan that you come up with is not very good because it's just a greedy algorithm basically to create a such a plan and sometimes you should do something like a backtracking so you say ah now i realize uh, if i shift this passenger to this other taxi then i actually have room for this passenger that otherwise i cannot transport him at all mm -hmm. um uh, yeah, so there are probably billions of, of possibilities to to put the passengers into the, the vehicles. And in order to solve something like this, you cannot really use a machine learning algorithm directly because there is nothing that tells you how you should change your current plan. So you basically, you have a plan where the, the taxis will go and which passengers will be in which taxi. And now... Yeah, ideally, you would have someone who tells you, yeah, you should change it in this way and it will, be, it will get better. The, the taxis will need to drive less uh, in mm -hmm. total or something like this. But there is nothing really uh, that can do that. Yeah, so basically what you need to do is you just need to try out the possibilities. Mm -hmm. And that's what is called like a meta heuristic algorithm um, mm -hmm. where you just try out possibilities and uh, for a certain time, so let's say for uh, 30 seconds or for an hour, you try to find a very good plan. And then uh, at the end of, of the time, you just check, okay, which one was the best one that I came up with? Ah, it was this one, so I will go with it. But maybe there is uh, another plan that you didn't consider and it's even much better. Mm -hmm. So um, these, these type of algorithms, they, they try to do very clever things so that they hopefully find a very good solution to the problem. But um, there's never a guarantee uh, for a meta heuristic algorithm that you found mm -hmm. the best solution. Yeah, and actually what is really nice about these algorithms is um, if you compare them to what a human would do. So maybe you have seen uh, some machine learning examples like handwritten digit recognition. Yeah? So someone mm -hmm. writes a a number on a pe uh, piece of paper and there is an algorithm that can find out which number you wrote and there we are actually happy when the the algorithm is as good as a human so let's say a, a normal human would recognize 99 percent of the numbers correctly and if we find an algorithm that also achieves 99 percent we are really happy and uh, in operations research it's different there, when you are just as good as a human, you are usually not happy at all. Um, you, you start to be happy when you're like twice as good as a human or something like that. So 
you can you could ask a human right uh, okay here you have a hundred taxis and a thousand passengers now please put them plan it somehow and the human will probably come up with a plan but usually the the meta heuristic algorithm will come up with a way better plan to solve the problem and that's really cool i think that yeah. um that we can build algorithms that are coming up with solutions that are much smarter than what we can come up with. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Now I understand it better. Uh, maybe I will go back a bit. Uh, when you were in Luxembourg, it seems that it was a huge step to decide to be a freelancer. How was this? Like, can you remember, like, how challenging it was? It could be an inspiration for others to take that step. Yes. Yeah, so indeed, it was a huge uh, challenge. But I didn't become a freelancer, like an independent freelancer. I was still working for a consultancy firm, but it was still a big step for me. Um, mm -hmm. at, at the time, it was, I, I was still at my first employer, even though I had seen a lot of different offices, etc. I was still at my first employer and I was also moving in a country where people spoke uh, mostly French at work uh, and so on. Yeah, and uh, but I, I learned a lot. So just doing the job search, I already learned a lot. There were like different websites where I where I looked for jobs and and then I tried to talk to people that I knew over some some corners and they and they gave me conflicting advice yeah, try this, this company, it's a nice one. And then someone else said, no, no, they are not, they are not so interesting. Um, rather do this or do that. And yeah, it was quite confusing. And then I had a couple of interviews and I had the impression that the, the people there, they were not really using the, the same language as I was using. So they were mentioning lots of concepts and what they do at work that I was not really familiar with. And then at this, this other interview, I had really the impression, okay, yeah, here I understand what they are talking about and what will be my role and what will be my responsibilities. It all seemed then very clear to me and uh, made more sense. Um, and I could understand and kind of picture what how my job would look like. And that was basically then the uh, position that I chose and they accepted me as well um, and i could use my experience on some technologies um, in the cloud sector um, for that position and that was that was good and it will combine the the skills that you have developed during the previous years in your next experience as uh, you mentioned about moya you might have found yourself knowing different parts of the work that you have to do that you already um, have experience on. Yeah. Yeah, that was very helpful. Yeah, indeed. And I always think it's good to pick something where you have some things that you already know. So you have you have kind of your home zone where you, or your comfort zone where you know, okay, yeah, this this topic in my new job, I already have some experience and it will be fine and I can manage. And this other part where I have absolutely no experience there, I can then learn something new. And yeah, I, I think that's a good trade-off. And you don't have to know everything in the job description for your next job. That's also an important takeaway. Yeah, sometimes in the job descriptions, it says like unrealistic expectations, like many years of experience or something. Do you think that I don't know if you have an experience on that. Do you think that uh, this could depend on the candidate? Like, for example, they ask for five years of experience, but when they interview someone, they say, okay, I think that this person is good for this position, despite they are not having as much experience as they ask it for. Yes. So I think there's always... Uh opportunities uh, open and you never know when you see a job ad you never know what the company really looks for and why they might take you in the end or why they won't take you it can be very stupid reasons mm -hmm. yeah. sometimes <laughs> yeah and so uh, i think it's always worth a try um, and i do hiring now and i can say that from my pr perspective for a healthy team 
you need people with a, a lot of experience, but you also need people with uh, a, a very little experience. The, the best teams are the teams where you have a good mix. If there is a team with a lot of uh, senior people on it, it's maybe lacking the people who come fresh out of university or uh, the people who have worked for two years or one year uh, on a job or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I, I, I think I would even look out for people who are not that senior um, for such a team. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's very smart to put number of years of experience into job ads generally, and I wouldn't pay too much attention. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting to know that you are uh, participating on hiring people. Is it a, like a technical interview, right? Yes. Maybe this also can help people. For example, if they would like to get the job, what, what is like the things that if you see a candidate that will encourage you to accept them, to join the company? Yeah. So I would say what is really important is that the candidate is interested in what the team does that they apply for mm -hmm. um, also in terms of the product so not just in terms of technology mm -hmm. that's always a plus so there are i think a lot of people who who want to work with a certain technology i was one of them <laughs> <laughs> at some point uh, and i said ah yeah this cool new framework i want to work with that so i'll try to find a team where i can do this or that's also fine but as someone who hires people i prefer candidates who are also really interested in what the team is doing and what the company is doing so i would say that's an advice uh, so if you apply to a company check out what they actually do what is their mission what does the team do that you apply for sometimes it's not so easy to find out um, but try your best and also think about whether that interests mm -hmm. you so um, because For you, it also doesn't make sense to work on a product that you don't find interesting at all. Yeah, and so that's really one important thing that I look out for um, in people who apply. Um, team player. Yeah, team player. Yeah, really, for me, it's a lot of time more about the soft skills than the, the hard mm -hmm. skills. So the ability to to listen and to have like a, a fascinating or a, um, where you where you feel there is some enthusiasm so you can you can have a technical discussion uh, with a candidate about a topic and you kind of exchange ideas and say yeah why um, why would you do it this way and not that way ah uh, yeah because of this and that reason ah interesting yeah and um, and if i have such a conversation with a candidate it's always also um, I think enjoyable for both, uh, for me and also for the, the person. Uh, it's just fun, right? It's the same fun that we want to have at work, mm -hmm. um, that we um, discuss about fascinating problems and, and how to solve them. Yeah. Um, and if this already happens in the interview, that's, that's also great. Um, and then I would say, be open with your weaknesses. If the employer is a good one, um, then you can be very open when you, when you think that you don't know something especially. So um, that's often not such a problem. And it's also very difficult to hide. And if I realize that a candidate doesn't know something but is trying to hide it, then I'm usually a bit drawn, drawn away. I know that this also happens and it's even not a deal breaker for, for me when, I, when in hiring, but It's uh, certainly a plus if a candidate openly says, I have absolutely no clue in this area, but I find it interesting and I'm really motivated to learn it. That's much better than when I have the impression that the candidate wants to kind of um, appear like knowing it, but in fact, there's not so much knowledge. Mm. Yeah, this is helpful. And uh, currently uh, at Moya, you are still um, working at the same position as you got hired at the first place, right? I'm a people manager by now. So mm -hmm. I'm also um, chapter lead. It's called at Moya. So mm -hmm. um, I'm the people manager for some colleagues um, since uh, two years now. Yeah. That's cool. I imagine this 
requires a lot of soft skills. Yeah, I agree. And oftentimes we are not really trained for that. So I find it sometimes a bit skeptical if um, people who are programmers become uh, kind of the boss of, of other people because we have no formal training in, in, in doing that. On the other hand, it also has some advantages because it's nice, uh, I guess it's nice if your, your boss is also technical and you, uh, if it's a good boss, you can discuss technical things with, with that person and um, that's also an advantage. But I had to learn a couple of lessons when I jumped into this new role uh, and um, I also did some rookie mistakes in people management. Yeah, for example, not uh, saying critical feedback because I didn't want to demotivate the person. So I, I thought, no, okay, I will hold this back. And yeah, and uh, I hope I'm, a, I'm improving <laughs> all the time on my, uh, on my soft skills, uh, but it certainly isn't easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Now you, you have more responsibilities and... Uh... Yeah, and you have much more responsibility with working with people than working with uh, software. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. People are way complicated <laughs> than software <laughs> <laughs> because they are like everyone has their situations and their life, etc. I value the empathy. Like, if someone has the empathy of understanding other situation, not not only emotionally. Sometimes someone makes mistake. And they are good, but uh, during that time they maybe they didn't drink their coffee or something. I don't know. And then later they will they can fix it, but they uh, need understanding. I, I just gave the example of coffee, but I don't know. Like uh, it's important to understand each other, and uh, uh, it's okay to have some space for making mistakes, and at the same time uh, um, space for improvement and. Uh, being better <laughs> yeah i also hope that the mistakes that i make are are kind of forgiven but i still think that sometimes they are not easily forgiven and that's also fine as a people manager i mean but um yeah for programming as long as you don't program a spaceship or something usually uh mistakes can be easily fixed so that it's uh, kind of normal to make mistakes all the time and fix them yeah, that's true. So what are your current challenges at Moya? I think um, sometimes there the, the hardest part is actually to integrate two systems which have a history, like they, um, they have a history, they are written by different people and the people had different ideas how to do things. And, and basically that ha holds a lot of room for, for conflicts, like both systems are coming with their own set of conventions and how to do things and it starts with a programming language but it doesn't end there um, and then you have to you have to moderate all of this and you have to find a good new way of doing things but there's it also holds holds a lot of potential because you can basically learn from the experience and the history of both systems as well and both uh, teams or people uh, the people that were working on these yeah, but that's that's a challenge, yeah. Definitely, yeah. And I think uh, now we can wrap up with... Uh, uh, do you have any advice you would like to share with the audience? Like some magical advice. I made it difficult. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> An advice that you wished you have known uh, when you were younger. Yeah, so uh, definitely one would be a study computer science and operations research <laughs> it's great uh, and if if you don't want to do that at least consider programming as as your your career it's also yeah it's just a lot of fun and uh, job safety for the future <laughs> yeah um yeah maybe some more general things is like um always try to make out the best uh, out of where you are at that time, like um, give your best and don't try to find the most fancy company right at the start or the most fancy project. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's always good to 
wherever you are and it's fine to start in a in a not so cool French enterprise <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, your career and you can still learn a lot there and yeah. that's also great yeah it's very nice advice and thanks a lot for your time I enjoyed talking to you I also enjoyed talking to you oh, thanks a lot thank you I'm looking forward to our next episode with a new guest and new inspiring story. Until then, stay safe and stay tuned to our next episode. Tic Tac, tackle the inspiration.